Welcome back to the Top Notch Documentaries YouTube channel. Richard Munoz Ramirez was born to Julian and Mercedes Ramirez on February 29th, 1960. The Ramirez's had lived in Juarez, Mexico for some time before making the decision to move to the much safer city of El Paso, Texas, where Richard was ultimately born. He was the last of five children, raised in a poor but hard-working family on Lido Street in El Paso. His family was religious and Richard grew to fear his disciplinarian father and the frequent dishing out of beatings toward his brothers, which weren't all that unwarranted because of their involvement in petty crime. Richard spoke on his father stating, They say it's worse to see someone you love getting tortured or hurt than being tortured or hurt yourself. I don't know if that's true or not, but I was real frightened of my father. When he lost it, I ran and hid. Whilst in school, it would be learned that Richard had temporal lobe epilepsy. He would suddenly break into a seizure, but everyone around him was supportive of his condition. Growing up, Richard was well liked. He was often cracking jokes in class, but was a promising student and athlete. Tragically, whilst Richard was succeeding in the classroom, a school teacher had begun abusing his brothers at their home under the guise of helping them through tutor work. It was the early 1970s and these sick predators were much less known to society. Unfortunately, this sexual abuse continued for some time and Richard may have been victimised, although he claims to not recall any victimisation. Despite his no recollection response, Richard did witness a young boy become a victim of a different neighbourhood predator a block from his home. Whether this played into a later fantasy of his is unclear, but a child having to witness such an act would surely scar their psyche. He would have been about 7 or 8 at this time. As mentioned, Richard was a great athlete in school, but because of his epilepsy condition he was booted from the school football team. As a result of this, Richard began focusing his attention on his Vietnam vet cousin Mike, who had just gotten back from the war zone. Mike had 29 confirmed kills and showed Richard graphic photographs from the war zone in Asia. Richard was mesmerised and probably in a state of awe at the photographs. Here was Mike, a war hero freshly home, telling an 11 year old Richard war stories and showing disturbing pictures to back up his experiences. Mike was clearly deranged and needed psychological help. He told Richard about the power that he could hold over another person by taking their life, playing the role of God essentially. Richard took it all in and was excited by stories of sadism and utter depravity. This was truly the turning point in his life. His religious upbringing didn't satisfy his newfound feelings of wanting to engage in the violent behaviour shown in Mike's photographs. Richard turned to the devil and Mike for mentorship and guidance. Mike taught Richard how to kill and blend into the darkness. He was very impressionable and paid attention to Mike, seeing him as a role model more so than his older brothers or father. He spent much time around Mike and his wife Jessie and this upset her. Despite working out a lot, Mike didn't have a job or any intent to work one. Arguments in their relationship eventually culminated in Mike shooting his own wife in the face right in front of a young Ramirez. Jessie died at the scene. Richard spoke on the aftermath of the murder saying, that day I went back to that apartment, it was like some kind of mystical experience. It was all quiet and still and hot in there. You could smell the dried blood. Particles of dust just seemed to hover in the air. I looked at that place where Jesse had fallen and died, and I got this kind of tingly feeling. It was the strangest thing. Then my father told me to look in her pocketbook for this jewellery my cousin wanted, and I dumped Jesse's pocketbook on the bed and looked through her things. It gave me the weirdest feeling. I mean, I knew her, and these were her things, and she was dead, murdered, gone, and I was touching her things. It made me feel in contact with her. From this point forward, Richard was changed forever. Mike managed to plead to an insanity defence and was sent off to a mental hospital. Shortly after this, Richard visited his brother in LA. He was a kid in a candy store. Taking in all the sights must have been an eye-opening experience for him. Richard was stubborn and believed that stealing things was the only way they would ever make it in the world. LA is known as the City of Angels, but Richard was certainly not interested in being an angel or living a hard-working life like his parents had. Richard returned back to El Paso following this trip and in his spare time he would engage in and learn more about crime. His favourite movie was the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and he was quoted as saying, It was ahead of its time. It portrayed something that really exists in human nature but no one will honestly admit. Strangely enough, Richard's favourite book was Truman Capote's In Cold Blood which depicted the Clutter family murders in Kansas by two drifters. 
Infamous serial killer BTK also found inspiration from the Clutter family murders. Richard was now in high school and despite rarely going to class, he did attend his job at an El Paso Holiday Inn. Whilst working at the Holiday Inn, Richard tried raping a young Mexican woman. Thankfully, her man returned to the room and beat Richard up. Richard lay unconscious on the floor as he was handcuffed and taken into custody. Despite him being held dead to rights, he was let go when the couple refused to testify against him. In 1977, Mike was freed from the mental institution and him and Richard got back to their mentor-student relationship. Not long after, Richard received the nickname Didos or Fingers because he stole everything and anything in his community. Ultimately, Richard realised that little opportunity existed in El Paso. He had experienced what California had to offer years prior and knew that wealthy people lived in the suburbs surrounding LA. They often kept their homes unlocked and were oblivious to the danger of doing so. Richard wanted to take full advantage and attain money and therefore he moved to LA in 1982 at the age of 22. Richard lived out of dirty hotel rooms and began using cocaine, going as far as to inject it. His world revolved around perpetual pleasure chasing behaviour like visiting movie theatres showing adult films, seeking out sex workers and gambling on the street and in pool halls. He didn't abstain from his desires and let's just say that he would have failed No Nut November. Richard's beliefs were surely a factor in determining his path in life. Richard was a Satanist at his core and worshipped the devil. His belief was that Satan would reward him for his actions and that he was protected, gaining an increase of unnatural power when he committed murder and crime. Richard would often drive to suburban areas and burglarise homes, selling valuable items to fences in downtown LA. The money funded his addictions and despite him living in squalor, he dreamed of one day owning a house with a dungeon. Inevitably, Richard's environment and his degeneracy surely put him in a bad mental state, one where murder was the only way forward. On April 10th, 1984, Ramirez murdered Mai Lung, a nine-year-old Chinese-American girl in the basement of his apartment building in the Tenderloin district of San Francisco. She was lured into the apartment basement. There she was attacked and raped by Ramirez. Mai Lung was then stabbed to death. The case of this young girl remained unsolved for another 25 years until it was tied to Ramirez in the year 2009. Ramirez remained free and was not considered a person of interest in the case at the time. The unsolved murder of this little girl gave way for a terrifying 14 month crime spree which included child abductions, murders, sexual assaults and everlasting trauma inflicted upon those who managed to live through the night. Residents of LA County were glad to see the daylight as the killer eventually dubbed the Night Stalker, took full advantage of the darkness, creating a wave of fear which swept across LA County and went so far as to reach San Francisco. On March 17, 1985, Ramirez rolled into the neighbourhood of Rosemead. Ramirez followed Maria Hernandez into her garage and as Maria fumbled with her door keys, Ramirez made a noise and Maria spun round, only to be greeted by a 22 calibre round to her face. Maria hit the floor and played dead. Miraculously, the bullet had diverted its path because it had hit her door keys. Ramirez, convinced that he'd killed Maria, made his way into the kitchen. Dale Okazaki, Maria's roommate, had heard the gunshot and crouched by the kitchen counter. Ramirez sussed that Dale was hiding and waited for her to raise her head to peek over the counter. When Dale raised her head, she locked eyes with Ramirez and he shot her in the face. Ramirez then brazenly left through the front door and was astonished to come face to face with Maria. She wasn't dead and for whatever reason, Ramirez let her live. He was observed walking hastily from the crime scene. Maria provided a sketch of the suspect and the suspect had even forgotten to retrieve his ACDC cap, which must have fallen off during the initial attempted murder of Maria. Police had some promising information and stuff to work with. Could this have been a jealous former partner of one of the women? Or was this something different entirely? They wouldn't have to wait long to get their answer. 40 minutes following the murder of Dale and the attempted murder of Maria, Sai Lin Yu, an Asian female, was yanked out of her car and shot to death for no apparent reason. The killer didn't even bother to take her car and police investigating were confused as to why someone would gun down a defenceless female in broad daylight. The cases bore sinister similarities. The same suspect was described by our witnesses and the same calibre of firearm was used. The suspect sketch even resembled the uncaught man who tried to abduct a woman. Clearly, the man responsible for these two murders was well active in LA County, 
and wasn't going to stop anytime soon. It would be a different neighbourhood known as Whittier that Ramirez snuck through an open window into the home of Vincent and Maxine Cesara. Ramirez crept through the home and pinpointed the residents' locations within the home. He raised his pistol and shot Vincent in the head as he lay asleep on the sofa. Maxine heard the gunshot and awoke to find Ramirez standing over her in bed. He tied her up and as Ramirez ransacked their house, Maxine managed to untie herself and grab Vincent's shotgun. She believed it to be loaded and when Ramirez returned, she aimed it at him and pulled the trigger. Tragically, Vincent had already removed the shells because his grandchildren had been over not long prior. Ramirez flipped out at nearly having been shot and ended up shooting and stabbing Maxine. As a final insult, he attempted to remove her heart with a kitchen knife. When this failed, he cut out her eyeballs and stored them in a jewellery box from the Cesara household. Ramirez then drove to his fence in downtown LA to sell stolen goods from the house. Following this, he returned to his hotel room at the infamous Cecil Hotel. In the rundown room, he looked at Maxine's eyes and laughed about what he'd just done. The city of LA was now in complete fear, and to make the situation even worse, the same killer who had been murdering random people was thought to be behind child abductions as well. At least some detectives believe this to be the case. In one such case, a young child had been taken from her bedroom and she'd been driven to a second location. Forced into a bag by the kidnapper, the girl was subjected to unspeakable acts of depravity by the offender before being let go by the kidnapper. Many in law enforcement couldn't comprehend the idea of a serial killer being this cold-blooded and varied in his MO. What serial killer kills young and old people and then kidnaps young children only to spare them? It didn't make any sense. The killer continued preying on homeowners in suburban LA County. The victims were both young and old and all had either been tortured or assaulted prior to murder. If a victim complied with the killer's demands then they were often spared but if they fought back they were brutally murdered. The killer had been known to use all manner of weapons during the home invasions and seemed to arrive quietly in the dead of night before wreaking havoc on the homeowners. He was extremely violent hence the injuries that victims suffered and all victims who had made it through the assaults had the same perspective and image when it came to the suspect. He was a Hispanic and tall, with bad teeth and an unforgettable foul body odour. He arrived quietly wearing all black clothing and slipped into the houses unnoticed before committing the crimes. Upon finishing, he fled back into the darkness. The killer would soon become dubbed the Night Stalker by the media. As the investigation into the Night Stalker crimes continued, cases were linked to the suspect. The suspect had drawn a pentagram at one of his crime scenes and the same suspect had even drawn a pentagram before taking flight from police, having just been pulled over for an attempted kidnapping. The cases tied to the Night Stalker were very sparse and scattered all over LA. The suspect could utilise the highway to travel in and out of neighbourhoods undetected. Richard Ramirez followed the Night Stalker case and adapted to the information that was being made public. When one of the victim phone calls was made public, he began removing the phone cords from crime scenes. He was getting off on the attention and it emboldened him and made him feel even more powerful. As he cruised the highways and into neighbourhoods in stolen vehicles, he blared ACDC's Highway to Hell album through his headphones. His favourite ACDC song was named Night Prowler and Richard loved it because he felt like it had been made for him. However, despite the enjoyment that Richard was deriving from the fear that his crimes were having on the public, the public outcry and demands for justice made him nervous. The reward money for information leading to an arrest hit $80,000 and Ramirez knew that he needed to get out of LA as soon as possible. There was now increased pressure to capture the killer and Richard was becoming increasingly paranoid because of the attention. It had reached boiling point. People who knew him by Rick were becoming increasingly suspicious of him. He had bad teeth like the suspect sketch and was constantly mentioning Satan. He loved heavy metal music and he wore all black. Richard had picked up on the weird glances and was mostly concerned about his fence, a man who he had stole stolen victim items to in the past. On at least one occasion, Richard had brought him some items with victim blood still on them. The fence wasn't stupid and probably knew that Richard was the Night Stalker. Ramirez selected a new destination, San Francisco. He headed north in a stolen Mercedes and proceeded to engage in even more criminal activity. It wouldn't take long for police to tie the Night Stalker LA murders 
to murders occurring in San Francisco. Brutal murders and pentagrams reappeared and the fear in San Francisco rose like it had done in LA. Ramirez didn't stay in San Francisco for long though and became concerned when he realised how small the city was. He made the decision to return back to LA. Richard stole an orange Toyota station wagon and got back up to his old tricks. He broke into the home of Bill Carnes and Carol Smith, both in their late 20s. The couple had been discussing preventative measures against the Night Stalker earlier that evening and in a cruel twist of fate, he had arrived. Ramirez shot Bill in the head before terrorising Carol. During the assault that followed, he forced her to say that she loved Satan. He laughed as he subjected her to further assaults and abuse. When he was done, he ransacked the property and fled the scene. Ramirez ditched the car and wiped the car of his prints, forgetting to wipe one off the rearview mirror. This fingerprint came back to haunt him when police recovered the vehicle. It turned out that a young boy had witnessed the orange Toyota slowly etching its way up the street near to the crime scene. The car had its headlights switched off and was totally out of place. He managed to write down the number plate and this number plate and interviews that had been conducted with people who believed that the man they all knew as Rick from El Paso was in fact the Night Stalker would ultimately lead to Ramirez's capture. Rick from El Paso would turn out to be Richard Ramirez according to a friend of a friend of Ramirez's. The man named Amando was put into a jail cell and threatened with accessory to murder charges. Confronted by the possibility of a lengthy prison sentence, he coughed up Rick's surname, Ramirez. Within a short space of time, a press conference was held to announce the search for the Night Stalker. He was Richard Munoz Ramirez, aged 25, a small time criminal with ties to Texas. The hunt to track down Ramirez was now on, but Ramirez wasn't even aware that he was being hunted. Ramirez had been out of state visiting family in Arizona. He returned to LA by bus and since news about his identity had already spread across the city, people spotted him and called him out. Screaming El Matador at him, Richard began running. After an intense chase and a series of broad daylight attempted carjackings, he was cornered in a Mexican-American neighbourhood. Beaten with a metal pipe, he was hissing at those chasing him. When he finally collapsed due to exhaustion, he was surrounded. If not for the arrival of police, he would have surely been killed. People began spitting at the Night Stalker and cursed him out. Richard Ramirez was taken to jail, having been brought down by what he would later describe as his own people. Unsurprisingly, Richards was found guilty of the Night Stalker murders and given the death penalty. The child abduction charges in this case were dropped and Richard didn't want to be known as a child molester. He would spend the rest of his life in a cell. Whilst incarcerated, Richard spent most of his time reading books on serial killers and letters from admirers in the free world. He'd never been very desirable on the street but now he's very much sought after by young women. Richard would actually get married to one of his admirers in 1996 while still on death row. The woman actually believed him to be innocent of the murders. Spending time in a concrete cell doesn't sound ideal and to Ramirez it was monotonous. Victim family members were forced to hear about his wedding and fan mail. I'm sure that it disgusted them to hear about how he was the centre of attention in the years following their loved ones murders. Richard Ramirez's life came to a conclusion on June 7th of 2013. He died as a result of cancer, never having been executed for his crimes. The life of Richard Ramirez was a troubling one. Many believe that Richard was born to become what he eventually became, a real life monster. He was a serious danger to society, especially women and children. And thankfully, he was locked up and forced to experience life in a cell. This has been the story of Richard Ramirez. As always, thank you for watching.